Hello and welcome to the ASEAN Pacific Live shows. Today we are here with a very special topic. We are going to discuss on the China and Brazil relations. Given the geopolitical uh, location of both countries, which is separated but vast maritime uh, area of Pacific Ocean, we are going to talk about the relation of two countries in the different parts of the world. Brazil is the largest country in both in South America or Latin America. It covers an area uh, of more than 8 million square kilometers and uh, with population of over 211 million. In this regard, Brazil's relation with the rising global power, the People's Republic of China, is extremely important. To better understand the comprehensive relation of these two countries, I am going to ask to my guest about the bilateral and diplomatic relation of these two countries since the 1990 to the present. My guest is Samuel Spellman. Samuel is a PhD candidate of international relations at the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais, Brazil. He is also a member of China's Development Working Group of the International Initiative, Initiative for the Promoting Political Economy, WIPPE. His research is mainly focused on the political economy of China and uses as a Marxist framework, Marxist economic framework for analysis. His recent work focuses on the contradiction of China's development in the rise, in its rise, monopoly capital theory, the Marxist theory of imperialism, and China-Brazil relations. Welcome, Samuel. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you, Lachman. It's, I'm glad, very glad to be here, actually. What time now, exactly in your side? Well, it's 10 a.m., 10.04. Oh, 10 a.m. Now in Kuala Lumpur, we have 9 p.m. It is a totally different, uh, the country in the part of the world. Uh, some of, I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to start with the question. Uh, the Brazil and the People's Republic of China, of our, both countries are currently having a hard uh, time talking to each other. During the Bolsonaro's administration, several questions have arisen the bilateral relation. Could you present us, please, with an overview about this uh, matter between the Brazil and the People's Republic of China? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, let, let's start with the, the first questions, right? So where does Bolsonaro comes from and how's the, the, how does this relation talks with the, the current, um, I don't know, international affairs in the world? So uh, what we may be seeing here is the is generally a, a rise in the far right uh, all over the world. We, we discuss this in terms, well, there are several discussions about it. So there, there are people who talk, talk about it as if we are seeing, I don't know, a certain populist rise. So I don't know, well, what, we have, well, what we would have is a, uh, a rise in the the popular affections for the, the far far edges of the specter in the, in the political sphere. I do not see it in this way. Uh, my, my understanding is that there is, a, a, there is probably something happening in the large scale of the capitalist reproduction itself. And th these changes are making some, I don't know, some certain effects emerge in the, the political economy and in the political state affairs of, of every society. So what, what we're seeing generally when we talk, I don't know, about, uh, let, let's get uh, Western Europe. Well, it, it started a bit with, with the, the, the Hungarian case, or maybe with Poland. But then we, we saw a, a far right, uh, I don't know, uh, upbringing also in France, also in England, also in Spain, in Italy. Uh, it's actually rich power, rich in power for a bit, a bit of time in Italy. So, um, well, then comes Bolsonaro, right? When we talk about the Brazilian specific case, Bolsonaro comes from the, the military. He, he is a military man. Uh, he, he, during his younger, younger age, I don't know, when he was in, in his mid 40s, he, he actually planned uh, a bit of a terrorist attack in, the, in Rio de Janeiro. A few people know about this. The, the case was eventually judged by a military court, and it, it was 
archived. You know, it was it was closed without resolution. But he was then dismissed from the military. He was then a captain of the army. He is actually uh, from formation. Bolsonaro is a paratrooper, right? uh, parachuter. Uh, you know, he, he comes from the sky. And, um, this is uh, throughout the, the Cold War. This was actually the branch of the army, which was designed with the, specifically with dealing with counterinsurgency. We, we saw the we saw parachutes being trained from the the four, 1940s onwards with these missions from uh, from the, the the French from French uh, attempts to recapture Argelia or French attempts to capture Vietnam it was all the parachutes being used there and they were trained you know in the United States it's all documented uh, it's a special force designed with counterinsurgency and this was the this is the background from Bolsonaro so when he closes uh, this chapter of his life, he, he then turns into a politician. He turns into a, a representative for, for the military, actually for the lower ranks of the military in municipal affairs in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so this was the 1980s, right? And Bolsonaro managed to represent all these spheres in the municipal sphere of, the, of, of Rio de Janeiro. But then he rises up to becoming a federal representative. He does. Uh, he enters the in the 1990s. He enters the Brazilian Chamber, you know, the lower chamber of our Parliament. Brazilian, as you may know, it's a is a presidential uh, country. So uh, all the powers that sometimes in some countries like France are designed to be divided between a president and a prime minister. In Brazil, they are centered only in the um, in the president. Uh, so Bolsonaro turns into a federal representative. And then he stays there for almost two decades. Uh, he only he, he was very low, low profile. I don't know. He was very uh, no, known for uh, very far right uh, uh, demonstrations. He, he was in the, in the mid 1990s. He called for the explicitly for the murder of the then president Fernando Henrique Cardoso. So uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso in Portuguese. So, what we are seeing here is the I mean had, that has a, a previous background, and then he rose to power uh, within this specifically specific context. He was always here. He he, he didn't just drop from nowhere. You know, the, this counter tendencies uh, they don't they just don't drop out from nowhere. It's, he, he was a, a, a career politician. He turned into the Brazilian president after seeing and. I don't know, being in within the public sphere for many years. And th th well, actually, this is the man. Now, I, I guess we should talk a bit about the how this turns into China, right? And then following up question, I guess. Now, you mentioned it, uh, that the formal diplomatic relation and bilateral relation of China is uh, and uh, Brazil is rather than recent. Uh, could you tell us uh, a bit more about uh, the content which Brazil and China re-entered former diplomatic relation? Of course. Um, well, since the president Bolsonaro previously, now we should, we, I guess it's widely known that Bolsonaro is from the far right and China is governed by a, a communist party. So Bolsonaro usually uses China as a... Um, uh, I don't know, as a counterfactual to his own government, right? If you don't like Bolsonaro, we'll live in China. It's this kind of arguing. He also is very aligned to the United States government, especially during the Trump administration. The, these links are, are very well known. Uh, just two weeks ago, actually, the, the third son of Bolsonaro, uh, Eduardo Bolsonaro, who is also a, a federal representative at the, the lower chamber right now, uh, he just, you know, he went visiting Donald Trump in his Trump Tower back in New York. So uh, the both the Bolsonaro family got very intertwined with the with the Trump administration during those two years that Bolsonaro led the Brazilian government uh, during the Trump administration. So how does this turn? I don't know. Uh, what what the what kind of world are we designing for the next decade? Right, because. What Trump did to the to the wider 
I don't know, confrontation between the United States and China was that he exposed it as uh, and he upgraded it into very largely into what could what many Americans are calling a new Cold War. This is a very great debate. There is a very interesting debate going on here in Brazil about the nature of this confrontation. Is it a Cold War? I don't, this Cold War serves to explain China-U.S. relations. I don't know, but I, I, I guess I actually agree a bit with, with it. But uh, I think that it will be decided bit, uh, in the next, next few years. So how does this turn into Bolsonaro? Bolsonaro, well, uh, as a president, Bolsonaro has this background. Bolsonaro leads the Brazilian government and Bolsonaro inserts the, the his administration into a framework of uh, aligning specifically with certain U.S. Uh, points uh, to confront China, he, but he uses discuss the, the discourse to, to do this. Uh, but what is the previous history of, of this? Uh, as everyone knows, China had a, a communist revolution back in the 19. Is which led to the, the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Uh, then China, of course, spent uh, maybe 20, 25 years being uh, not, de not declared the, the, the actual government of, the, of China itself. The government was recognized as being in Taiwan um, with under the, the, the leadership of what that was then the Wu Mingang Party and uh, leading, of course, what is still the Republic of China. Uh, so the Republic of China was, of course, recognized as the main government of China. But everything changed with the normalization that happened in the late Mao years and uh, in the early period of Deng Xiaoping's leadership of China. Uh, it all changed in the 1970s, actually. So uh, when famously Mao Call, uh, said someone to call Kissinger and, and, and arrange a meeting with what was then President Richard Nixon. Uh, the normalization process all happened, and as a consequence, uh, several key allies of the United States first reestablished their relationship with China. This was the case of then military government of Brazil. Brazil during the Cold War was uh, governed by a military coup, by a military government which started in a military coup in the 1960s. So it went with maybe 21 years of, uh, of military-led uh, dictatorship in Brazil. It was actually a an alliance between the military and certain s sectors of the, you know, the, the upper bourgeoisie of Brazil. But the, the key point here is to understand that during the military uh, uh, government, the Bra Brazil reestablished the relationship with the formal relationship with the, the Pe People's Republic of China. This change in the, the actual name, aim of the country, the representations, all of this, these matters were resolved in 1974. So, where, where does this lead us? This leads us to understand that Brazil, uh, in, during the, the Cold War and from previous administrations, actually, Brazil had a very close to reality policy of trying to both attend the United States interests, but also its own, and may and some at some times try to put one power against the other and to, in, to further gain some, some benefits for itself. We also know that this is the military government from the far right, which allowed Brazil, so there was no ideological counterfactual to Brazil uh, re-establishing these relations with China during the 1970s, because this was a very weak China still. Uh, the Deng Xiaoping calls it. Uh, they, they had to re-establish the, the, well, in order to, to achieve the four modernizations, China had to uh, re-establish these relations with the whole world and develop the, their own technologies. So, uh, so Brazil entered this relationship. But this was also very limited to the diplomatic sphere. There were no big economic exchanges between the two countries, you know. It was still 1970s. Uh, it, it actually started growing in the 1990s. And, but all throughout this period, from the 1970s onward, Brazil never had a, a, an explicit confrontational uh, policy, foreign policy towards China. It only changed 
within the Bolsonaro administration. Uh, where actually, we should get back to this maybe a, li a little bit later when we talk about the BRICS, right? Now, the, the, over the time, um, I think the China and Brazil relation have become more and more uh, the side of the commercial things. How does the, the commercial of the tra uh, transmission is like it? Well, um, when we talk about commerce between China and Brazil, we have to understand this in a historical context. So, back in the 1990s, Brazil started to open itself to the world market, right? Brazil was very close. It had a, a well, it's not, well, not it was on all that close, you know, it was not, not a, an isolated economy as China was during the Maoist period. But, uh, you know, Brazil did not uh, import a lot of industrialized um, eat items. It, their main relations were, commercial relations were very linked to, to both Europe, especially Western Europe and, and the, and the United States a bit following that, and then to Latin American partners. So, uh, as you see, Brazil imported a, a largely very sophisticated materials from Europe. Some as one item or another from the United States. This was the, uh, the the main composition. And Brazil, Brazil's links were very regional. So we exported a lot of industrialized items like buses and automobiles especially, but also uh, chemistry items to, to Argentina. Argentina exported some items to us. It was very regional, you know, regional. Uh, but this was also the context in the early 1990s. By the mid-1990s, uh, over 1995, uh, Japan started appearing in our exports. So uh, Japan came from um, their own process of uh, largely ascending in the world sphere, you know, Today, not, nobody actually talks about that much about Japan, right? But in the 1980s, Japan was the, the real big deal. It was, it was appearing in the world world market, and it, it started, I don't know, expanding their economy towards the towards the whole world. So uh, we started having commerce with them, but it was still very limited. Uh, as you as you mentioned in the, when you start talking, we are very afar, right? No. Uh, we are very far from the from Eastern Asia. We are all, all the way across the world, uh, and and yet uh, the, the the whole world market was restricting itself so that we could make commerce. So uh, you know when Japan started appearing, it proved that the, these lines of communication and lines of trade were now possible, were now viable. And Brazil proved to be a large, large, very large market, right? We, are, we were at this point, I don't know, 190 million. We are, today it's about 220 million Brazilians. So uh, we are a very large market, right? And um, Japan started appearing, but they did not have the, uh, the, the specific items that Brazil uh, was actually in, in demand. We still produce them locally. But when China appears in the, the picture, China's China came from a process of largely speeding up their industrialization processes in several materials. When we talk about the early 1990s with China producing toys and things like that, um, China by the late 1990s was produced largely uh, for exportation actually, very, very large. Uh, equipment for for construction for for industry right these are um, well these are investments that go intra intra into industry and they can be used for production well pretty much anything right so China came into this process of industrialization with that but also China uh, by doing this that China was also um, breaking up I don't know affecting the existing uh, suppliers of these products, right? Even though they are very, uh, very expensive, they are industrial, so they they could be undermined by uh, cheaper values, right? If you, if you come up with a better price, then you will be excluded from the market. And China got, got into this. So when China started to take the, this specific spot from the local markets here in South America, then China quickly expanded their share of the of well our balance of payments you know? so uh, 
you see you see what, what goes on right china uh, when we do this uh, then you affect the, the industrial production here in brazil the industrial production in argentina the industrial production actually in mexico uh, so it's the very it's very important to understand this because by the mid 2020s china was actually be largely and quickly becoming our main commercial partner it was almost surpassing the united states it surpassed that you know in uh, 2011 i guess but uh, so it was very quick it was very it was really a very quick transformation for, for our economy um but this uh was i don't know to for you to understand that this process you actually everyone has to live in a certain country to understand certain process right so when we talked about china back when i was a kid we talked about them producing you know cheap materials that that, that conversation about toys and that kind of, that kind of thing but uh there were uh, there were processes going on deeper that were in place so that it largely affected the the whole the whole formation of our economy and this led to the to i don't know certain relations during the mid 1920s right mid 1920 uh, 2000s okay so i guess i, I answered this one now um as a rising power the china has influence of the economy of many country if regional or international my question will be about the brazilia has china's rise in, has impacted the, on the brazilian economy if yes uh, what is the, the issues regarding this aspect so uh the process that that went on in brazil uh, is actually a part of something larger uh, this was not directed towards brazil but th this was this happened to mainly everyone china's rise uh, as not only as a global power but also comes with being a economic power uh, and this largely appeared in the the footprint the economic footprint during the 1990s during the 2000s and in the last decade when i talk about the, the these issues they they are very to me at least they are very interesting because the the diplomatic diplomatically when we talk about the lula administration we all remember about the formation of BRICS and the first steps towards the the realignment but this was a very uh, intense political discussion during the the mid 2000s about how to deal with china china had just a few years back in 2001 china joined the world trade organization so uh what the, how does this impact the the world economy china just managed to get into the larger sphere of i don't know uh collective recognition collective recognizement of its capacity to trade with the world so it opened uh, their market to the to the world and this integration of china into the global capitalist organizations uh, led to actually deeper transformations domestically this was my, my last response but now uh how do you manage that because you cannot control the, the economy of another country so uh, how do we realign our domestic economy in order to either compete or to uh, stay alive? So Brazil actually tried to protect one or two sectors during the 2000s, but uh, China's rise also led to an increase in demand for certain products. And not many people know, but even though China is very big, um, they do not have that many arable uh, land. China only has about 13% of it of its territory as arable land, so it has to use it very intelligently. And this is very important because China had to import a lot of, a lot of food, um, a lot of oil. So here comes Brazil, right? We are a very large country. We we actually we produce a lot of food. We can we have that capacity. We have obviously domestic problems with uh, with hunger. We have we have these problems historically and this is all related to the class organization of brazil but internationally we we have a large history of exporting um you know not only rare materials but also and other commodities like rice uh, beans and 
but also some certain metals like iron and iron and like coal. So there there is a, an opening here for the, the Brazilian market, and we expanded in that, that segment. So this debate that happened within the Lula administration itself about how to deal with the the industrial footprint of China actually turned into an opening for the the agribusiness. Uh, sector to expand towards the Chinese market that was expanding and it had a tendency to expand. So we just went with it. You know, Brazil by 2007 was uh, rapidly increasing its exports to China and this debate was but closed, you know. Uh, it also has to do with the, the fact that the, the industrials are also the, the landowners in Brazil. So they are very uh, alike. Uh, uh, so it's the same people who are uh, losing the in, the in the industry and they can relocate to other areas. Some of them relocated actually to China. Uh, but over here, they start producing the, these, uh, these items. And so the Brazilian economy expanded a lot with the, the, enter, the, with the entrance of all those dollars, right? Because Brazil is now uh, uh, making a lot of commerce to China. And uh, this increase in the receivable of international um, well, you know, uh, the, the world payment system is all uh, connected to the dollars. So the Brazilian economy received a lot of it. And by using these dollars, we actually created an area in domestic era of development here. Uh, it, this, 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 all this money enabled the Lula administration's expansion uh, to, of the of the social we welfare system. The the workers' party administration of Lula uh, changed a lot of our domestic economy. It, it enabled the, the, the reorganization of the third sector, right, the, of the of the commerce the, domestically, of the services and all, all that kind of activities. Uh, but also, uh, at the time, we did not comprehend it yet, that it was caused by this expansion of the commerce to China. And it, this is very important because when this commerce to China um, started to fall behind of the expectations of the world market and of our own uh, enterprises, the Brazilian economy turns to a, a dip. You know, it, it's, it dips towards recession by the, the mid 2010s. It, it, this was a bit in 2013 when Brazil had lots of demonstrations and that. Uh, and that kind of movement. So it's all connected, right? And this is very important to understand the, the relationship between the both between both countries. You, Samba, you mentioned uh, the both countries shared uh, the same context in the socio-economical uh, context during the 1990s. Would you mind uh, telling us two particular issues facing the Brazilian economy and uh, there were a lot of parallels to the East Asian economic crisis of the late 1990? Yes, of course. Um, so when we focus on the 1990s, the, the important thing to know is that both countries were opening to what was the world market, both China and Brazil, uh, but they opened differently. China had its own development processes of incentive and uh, it managed to use its workforce as a leverage to, to get better access to the world market, but also in their own terms. So if you have to operate in China, you will have to partner up with the Chinese state and develop its own uh, strategies with technology transfer, trans transference and all that sort of policies. When you deal with the Brazilian economy, we are looking at uh, an explicit, explicitly affected by the 1980s crisis of, of capitalism uh, in the, the periphery of the world. So we had a very large problem of the, in, at the balance of payments, uh, which means that we had a very, diff uh, a very difficult time uh, managing our, our currency. Well, Brazil experienced by the, the late years of the dictatorship uh, that I just mentioned and, and the, the start of this conversation, Brazil experienced uh, hyperinflation. And this was very traumatizing to, to the, the Brazilian economy. We lived under it for maybe 15 years. It got out of control by the, 
the late 1980s. And um, this was a, largely a process dealing with the, the exports, with the, the whole, uh, what is the issue with development in the South? The, the issue is that we all produce um, the same items. We all produce uh, iron ore, we all produce uh, minerals, we all produce uh, agricultural um, items. So uh, when we all trade this, we all have the, a disparity in the, in the price of trade in the world market. Of course, there are other factors in this. There is obviously an intervention by the United States and the Western European countries in our domestic economies. But the main point here is that since we all produce it, then we all supply the demand. And because of this, uh, when everyone is producing the same item, the, the price falls, the price tend, tend, tends to fall. And this is a, a very big issue. This created the environment for the crisis in the 1980s and 1990s. So this, uh, the several crises that happened this, in the South, uh, they are obviously uh, they are obviously connected to the the previous crisis in the the core capitalist economies in the 1970s, but also to domestic factors. So in, by the early 1990s, the economic crisis started happening all over the place, right? It happened in Argentina, it happened in Mexico, and eventually it got to Brazil as well, in this part of the world, actually. When we look at Asia now, uh, what, what we saw was uh, largely the, the the whole arrangement of economies in, in Eastern Asia managed to, to start growing by the 1990s as a, also a byproduct of not only uh, the expansion of the, the U.S. market of, uh, of goods and products, but also a certain relocation of the industrial uh, production from Japan to, to other countries. So this is the the, the less large push for uh, South of Korea, for China, for the uh, for the Republic of China, you know, for for Taiwan as well. And uh, starting it, this also kickstarted the process of industrialization for other countries in East Asia, right? So this was the start for Vietnam. This was the the reestablishment of the industry in Malaysia as well, in Singapore. Singapore actually has a very interesting history, but also previous to this process. Um, and all these countries start trading, right? Indonesia as well. But uh, by the late 1990s, um, certain specific crises in East Asia managed to get out of hand and expand it to, towards the whole region. And so, as we were having a, a domestic crisis in Brazil, China was having a domestic crisis, an economic domestic crisis as well in, in East Asia. And the formation, the economic formation of the two countries was not that that many ap that's far apart. Of course, China has its own specific uh, specific characteristics. China has a large larger population, a very, a very large one. Brazil has uh, that much land. These are specific characteristics to, to each nation. But in GDP, Myers, the, the two countries were very close. They, were, they had almost the same GDP by 1997, but China's management to get out of the, the East Asian economic crisis in the 1990s may, uh, led it to have a growing economy that achieved the, the double of, the, of Brazilian GDP only five years later. You know, so we just managed to double it within, from 1997 to 2001, and this, this was a very big, big deal. You know? This was the, the first evidence that China was having its own processes during this period. So uh, there are actually there are parallels, but also this uh, shows us that something was happening also in the world market. Uh, the models for com commerce in the international arena were very different. Brazil was in the process of opening in the 1990s. But China, no, China um, embraced the, I don't know, a certain export-led model. I do not believe that this was uh, dominant. The dominant forces are obviously the, the internal markets of China. But uh, towards the, the exterior world, China invested very much in the in this export-led model, as well as the, the whole region. China also managed to use its public uh, public banks uh, in a certain way to, to help manage the, the whole East Asian crisis. It's, it's aligned itself with Japan 
and other uh, certain nations in, China, in Asia to overcome this crisis. This also did not happen in South America. So, uh, as, as you can see, the, the, the two regions diverged in this process. And this led, to the, obviously, to the context of the 2000s. Okay? It's, um, Yes, yes, uh, now I'm here. Uh, I'm going to ask the one uh, question about the Lula administration. How was the China's Brazil relation during the Lula administration? And as well, uh, we all understand uh, the early 2000s was the point in which the BRICS uh, nations were recognized as being the main upcoming economies of the war century. Could you tell us about the uh, this con uh, contact of uh, context of the Brazil. Oh sure. So as I previously explained, uh, the the main question, the the main thing is happening the Lula administration was how to manage, uh, you know, the uh, a certain recovery from a, a, a certain very specific economic crisis that happened in two thousand two. Uh, Brazil had a very difficult period from the 1990s towards the, the 2000 decade. And uh, the, the, the footprint from the previous administration was not very good. Brazil ex uh, embraced during the Fernando Henrique Cardoso administration, uh, Brazil embraced the ver their ne neoliberal creed of the 1990s. So it opened to the world market without, uh, without any requirements. But it also privatized a, a lot of its uh, its public economy, so the the Lula administration could not use this uh, this specific tools of for, uh, of arrangement, so for uh, for building a specific uh, I don't know initiative for for the for that decade, but uh, and yet Lula also embraced a bit of the of the early 2000s neoliberal creed as well. It's, but the, the neoliberal ideology changed towards a, a social uh, in, um, variant of, of it, you know, so, social uh, realignment. And so it started caring about uh, how education factors within the, the large, uh, larger economic factors domestically, how, the, how do you supply the, the poorest of the country with the, the specific tools for them, their upbringing. Of course, this, this also leaves a, a lot of people behind, right? This kind of, of thinking, because if, you, um, if you're not looking towards uplifting everyone, but just one or two, then you are segmenting the population as well. But the Lula administration came up with a plan to reduce liberty, actually to distribute the, the welfare of the, of the Brazilian system was the, the the miserable population of Brazil. This was a period that Brazil was still haunted by hunger. You know, this was the, this was actually my childhood. No, no, I, I did not spend. Uh, I did not went through hunger, but I I saw it. You know, it it, it was on the streets, and uh, it, it was a very very big deal because uh, food was accessible, but not not to everyone. Housing was not not accessible. Housing was very lacking actually. And uh, there was a, a very big transformation during this, this early period. We are still catching up with it, actually. Uh, the process of development is very, is very interesting because it changes what you see every day, right? Uh, but also this carried a lot of contradictions with this process because, uh, well, but this has, actually, this has a lot to do with the, the relationship to China uh, because, but, even though everyone was now being able to consume, we were not consuming our own products. We were importing a lot. We were, uh, certain certain uh, items started to, to appear in, uh, in our uh, supermarkets a lot. That, that um, you, you know, it, it has a, a, a certain glow. The, the, what you import is different. So you, you seek to, uh, to buy these products as, as a, an affluent representation of your on welfare, and you go to the supermarket and you buy a beer by Heineken and all of that. Uh, but how does the how does these products get to your supermarket? It's not only the the world market getting into your everyday life, right? The Brazilian companies 
uh, received a lot of profits from the trade with China. What, what, what the president to you previously about the, the whole issue of exporting iron ore and coal and all of that. So, so this commodities start to be exported to China and the profits from this enable the Brazilian companies to start buying other companies, the world market. And by the time Brazil will start developing a lot, uh, what we see is that uh, Brazil start buying uh, a lot of international companies. So we expand into the, the mining industry, we expand into the um, we expand into the, the food production industry. We buy a lot of the food production in the United States, actually. Brazil owns it. But not, not Brazil, the nation, but Brazil, some Brazilian companies own a lot of it. Some Brazilian companies own Heineken right now. Uh, so, you know, it's just started appearing in domestic markets because we started, we started uh, imp either importing or locally producing it. But it only started be to, be as a consequence on the acquiring of dollars through this commerce to China. So, so this start to, uh, as I mentioned, this start to change our domestic composition of, of the whole economy. But this, this also uh, led to a disincentive, a very explicit disincentive towards industrialization because we were replacing the, the, the domestic demands for, the, for these products with imports. And if the, the whole relation of the whole commercial relation to China, it all depends on the prices of these commodities. So if China starts paying um, a, a little less for uh, every ton of, I don't know, every tonnage of um, grains, then, then, you know, even though they are still buying the same products, then at the same amount, we are now receiving less money. And this also changes the, the relationship between the Brazil real, which is our domestic currency to the United States dollar. If the commerce falls, then the then the Brazilian dollar, then the Brazilian real devaluates towards the dollar. And as a consequence, our, dom our uh, domestic economy started to, to change as well. Uh, but this also led to certain very specific and very interesting, actually, sensations in the everyday life. Because now, uh, suddenly for seven to eight years you had the, the, such a great purchase power that you could uh, access a lot of items that you never saw and and suddenly now that these products uh, actually are i don't know rising their prices why why is my life getting uh not worse but it also is advancing in uh in, in the, a lesser pace than previously right you Every economy, when an economy decelerates, you feel this sensation, and Brazil starts to feel it. And this is the context where everything changed by the mid 2000s, by the mid 2010s. But this is also after the Lula administration. So I'll stop here um, by separating the, the this context of a, a large happiness that the Brazilian society had in the in the late 2000s. Everybody knows that we we were. Cool. Brazil was cool. Brazil had won the Olympics. Brazil had uh, achieved the, the I don't know the the it could now have an Olympics here. We could have a World Cup here. We were the guys, right? Brazil was the the real big deal. But then uh, it took a dip to towards the woods, and we start to to see the current affairs of today. Now my question, uh, I'm going to ask another question uh, from what we under, you mentioned it. We can understand that there was a diplomatic consolidation moment going uh, on within the diplomatic crisis in Brazil in the late 2000s. The coincidence with the ending of the Lula administration and Workers' Party consolidation of power with the following mandate, which was headed by the Dilma Rousseff. Could you tell us, please, uh, the differences between the governments and uh, how this affected the bilateral relation between the, the Brazil and the People's Republic of China? Of course. So um, now we will, uh, I guess I, I explained it specifically how the, the whole commerce with China affected not only the domestic functions of, Brazil, of the Brazilian economy, but also our, evidently our uh, our 
our connections to the world market. But there was certain aspects that the Lula administration there were there what that were also a, a product of itself. Uh, so Lula actually was, as we discovered later when he was gone, we he was pretty good in diplomatic affairs. He was actually understood as uh, too too good actually for the the, the whole the whole diplomatic affair, affairs of Brazil. It started opening uh, new spheres for, for Brazilian intervention overseas. Brazil started to uh, to open certain markets that it had it, it could never have been op opening up. Brazil started also to uh, organize itself and confront certain aspects of the of the United States. Um, I, gonna, I don't know foreign policy in the world. So Brazil started uh, started to get a bit closer to a lot of countries, you know, Brazil restructured the, the organization of the Portuguese speaking countries, which are, as everybody knows, you know, but not only Brazil, but in Portugal as well, but also Portuguese colonies in, the, in East Asia and also in Africa, like Angola and East Timor, uh, which is very close to, to Indonesia, actually. Uh, so uh, this Brazil also opened it up to certain that certain relations that were could never have been possible previously so brazil started to uh, get closer to the developing countries of the world and form the g20 uh, in order to better confront the united states initiatives in the world market and brazil also uh, started to get closer to these other three and later four nations that compose the BRICS as they were the core uh, industrializing countries in the, the start of the century. Uh, everybody was then affected by, of, of course, the, the Chinese growth and the Chinese relations, but it, this also enabled us to, to portray all, all these affairs. But this was all these initiatives, all these separate initiatives had their own victories, as I mentioned. Brazil won the, 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 the right to have a World Cup here, this was a very public affairs demonstration, as the people in um, international relations call it. It was a very, uh, it was a very great initiative of soft power, soft power by Brazil. But also, when Lula was gone, then, when the the the, the core uh, heads of the diplomatic team of Brazil started to retire or being replaced by the by newcomers, uh, then things started to change. Because Dilma Rousseff, which was our president, our first female president, and also a member of the Workers' Party, which is the, the party from Lula, uh, she was not as able as Lula to get into the, these affairs. She, um, she just did not have the, the talent for it. You know, the Dilma is a very interesting person. She is very intelligent, but also she's very confrontational, personally. It's, it's why, this is, everybody not actually knows this. Uh, these are actually this this very specific things about the, her personality actually uh, helped to help explain the the whole crisis that she had in the by the late 2014 by, by, by that period and which led to her impeachment which I can get if you if you uh, we have time I can return to this spe specific period but the whole question is that even though in her start, the start of her mandate, she was very popular. Uh, she did not have this ability. And this happened in a specific moment where not only the, the Chinese commerce to Brazil changed and China started to buy less uh, from Brazil a bit uh, from commodities, but also it was a period where the international co uh, commodities market, um, you know, it, it started to dis disaccelerate. And so the international prices of commodities it shrank, and when this happens to, to to a country, then it affects the whole balance of payments issue, and this affected her government still. So she could not open new markets, and the international price of for these commodities start shrinking. So she could not react to this. She, she was just politically unable, and economically, uh, the, the the economy started to to go uh, to other directions that were incorrect. So uh, this is deeply affected the, the Brazilian relationship to the diplomatic sphere in the world, but also this affected the Brazilian relationship to China, 
by the, the by the same period China uh, not only overcame the 2008 crisis um, but also China realigned its own domestic uh, domestic growth pattern and this also obviously affected the whole economies of the world and but also China's engagement to the to the whole world uh, changed uh, as well and, and so it had grown so much you know it had grown that that far that uh, it actually starts separating itself from the remaining BRICS. Even though the, the Brazilian economy, the Russian economy, the Indian economy were also growing a lot, and South Africa was a, also a key partner to this, uh, China just grew too much and it started to actually be called to decide on the world affairs as a part to the United States. This was, this was that, that context that a, a lot of economists and political economists as well, start calling um, the, the Chimerica period. So the, the, two, the two countries go so much together that the, the China helped the, the reestablishment of the, of the domestic economies, the refinanciation of that in Western Europe, especially in the south, south side of the Western Europe. Uh, China also led to the, I don't know, China's uh, restarting of, the economy, that, of their economy enabled the, the reinvestment of certain funds from the United States to China. So the two economies were already very intertwined, the, the Chinese and the American economies, but they grow too closer. They, they grow too, too closer in this period. Um, the, there were actually meetings between uh, then Vice President Biden and then Vice President Xi Jinping um, to, to talk about the, these issues and to better understand the relationship with the two countries. Um, but obviously this sounds like a, a long time ago, right? But this also is a, is a very interesting process. So China distances itself uh, by its own characteristics. It distances itself from the remaining BRICS countries and from Brazil as well. So obviously this would change our, our commercial relationship to one another. This actually maybe um, the the lack of the there are very there are a lot of explanations to this but what I would like to highlight is that uh, the absence of that of explicit dialogue between the two countries and certain initiatives uh, started to, to not just to just not happen the, the, they started to you know that they started to, to get slower and they were not approved so certain corporation um, alternatives to, to this whole process of economic slowdown were not enacted. And, and this is the, the story of the, maybe the previous story of what we can oversee here uh, today is that the BRICS countries are all, all uh, ex they are all growing apart, you know, especially Brazil, India from Russia and China. And this is maybe the, our context today. The uh, the early 2000s uh, also a certain distorting of China as a BRICS uh, country uh, and China distancing itself economically from the other developing countries, economies and the structure of China's global power enabled discussion over the, its rise and the possibility of the sharing of global power with the United States of America. This is also the content of the, the passage of the central power from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping. <clears throat> How do you uh, think this change affected the, the bilateral relation between the, the Brazil and the, the China? Well, I think that um, the, the, the bilateral relations were very, um, very much affected. Uh, of course, we, we as Brazilians, we did not had the, the economic growth that was required to, to also intermediate these affairs. But also, uh, this starting period also proved to China that China could achieve something more than just relying itself towards the developing countries. So, so this is the, also the period that the, the Chinese leadership also started to rethink their position in the world, not only as a developing country, but also as a country that could promote certain initiatives that could be created the, the, the whole world. 
the passage from Hu Jintao, which all, which also was very important, a very important president. He uh, he came up with certain uh, concepts to the Chinese uh, to the Chinese uh, development, which dealt with the with China's specific rise in the world affairs. Uh, so Hu Jintao went, went on a, a lot about this as. You know, as an explicit declaration that China's rise would be peaceful, China's rise would be a uh, development rise, uh, the, the, the bringing of, uh, of a country that was previously very poor and now was dealing with world affairs. But this also highlighted the, the possibility to create these initiatives. And so China created a lot of cooperation initiatives in the, the whole world. And China created the, the Chinese initiative for Africa as well. China created their own forums to, towards South America, some forums in Central America as well. Uh, China created the, their initiative towards the, the Eastern European countries, like, uh, especially from the Balkans, which is the, uh, which was then 16 plus one group and later became 17 plus one when Greece entered the, the affairs. Uh, China also uh, was also um, uh, an advisable member to the uh, to certain relations in Southeast Asia, and well, this war and China also started to uh, to re-enter certain initi initiatives in Central Asia. So what we're seeing here is that China, when it when China did not have uh, any, any specific initiative in place, China created one. So China, um, in South America or in Africa, China created their own initiatives. But where they already existed, when these regional structures already existed, like in East Asia or in Central Asia, China integrated their, their existing, um, ex existing initiatives or existing systems or um, in, in a manner that China could um, not only integrate, but also influence these affairs. China also upgraded their bilateral relations to each and every country. So uh, so they all they have a bilateral relation, a bare bilateral relation to each country they, they already are in trade. They also are now interacting with regional uh, institutions. And China is also, um, as I first mentioned, China is also uh, discussion with the United States actually in Western Europe in a um, lesser degree, the, the whole destiny of the, the world economy. Uh, it, this was also very new. By the time you get to Xi Jinping then, Xi Jinping launched, launched the, uh, what would then be the, the confirmation, the, the, ex, the explicit, um, explicit manner, the, the explicit form of, the, of their core policy towards their own region. Which was a layer called the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Um, first of all, obviously it had a, a very Chinese name, right? It was the uh, One Belt One Road, which translated very, it sounded very good in Chinese, but it also uh, could not reach uh, the the international the dimension of English, and then they changed it to Belt and Road Initiative. So, uh, what you see is a, an evolutionary process in which China learns with their own experiences and China proposes new institutions where it seeks, I don't know, it seeks their own objectives of state and of objectives of commerce. Uh, but this also affects the existing structures as well. So uh, Brazil, during the 2000s, Brazil tried to do this. Brazil tried to create their own institutions. Brazil tried to establish their, their own corporation initiatives in Africa, Brazil tried to, to achieve these markets, Brazil tried to uh, restructure the arrangements existing in South America as well, in order to have a better, uh, better not only diplomatic, but also commercial uh, relationship to Venezuela, to Argentina, to Bolivia. Uh, this all, was all, also very well done, but this backtracked by the 2010s. We, right now, actually, in South America, we are discussing sometimes the very much the destruction of the structures we created previously. Brazilian initiatives in Africa all, all started to backtrack. Brazil is closing embassies in, in Africa, in Western Africa. Uh, but Brazil is discussing explicitly the actually the breakup of Mercosur, which is our southern of the of sovereign corner of the 
of the of South America's uh, uh, trade agreement. You know, the, the Mercosur is like the, the is like the euro, but obviously it not it, it never reached that that point. But um, what what I'm trying to say is that we backtrack so much that we are now destructing our own spheres of influence and our own actual uh, action in the in our own continent and this is this goes to the very much the opposite what of what, what china does so uh, this will be a problem whenever uh, this government by bolsonaro whenever he leaves the office this will be a very much a big problem to the next president because they will have to reestablish it all in order to triple to, to uh, to establish the institutions that we own created a, a decade ago. So th this is the dimension of the of the problem in Brazil. Uh, by the mid 2010s, Brazil had several uh, political crises, uh, which culminated uh, in the impeachment trial of the the president Dilma Rousseff. Uh, how was this transition like and especially i would like to ask about uh, what kind of the impact of this issue had over the china and brazil relation if 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 there is a, a huge impact of course uh so uh as i mentioned brazil had, a, had very much got itself into a point where our domestic economy was starting to to frail Brazil also uh, started having a, a large problem with corruption. You know, Brazil has uh, corruption in the in developing countries is historical. It has the, its own characteristics, and I believe that we also, uh, through this information, through uh, a, a big under a, a very not well made understanding of what actually corruption is. We not we never hear about corruption in France or in Spain or in the United States, but it also happens there, you know. Uh, so we all think that it's a, a matter of principle and a, and a matter of uh, of the Brazilian formation. It's all our fault, and not a deeper thing dealing with the whole uh, arrangements that sustain the the capitalist system. So. Through this understanding of corruption as a as a fail of principle, the Brazilian people uh, started to to protest very much by the mid 2013s over very small actually very small uh, disengagements you know very very small what seen now very small uh, reasons to protest. But was then when I when I was a teenager, it was very and um, it was very interesting because we were all protesting for something that was our right. It's it, it all started the the the, the whole protest thing in, by the mid 2013. It all started over uh, bus fares. You know the the price you pay you pay to to go somewhere by, by, by bus. It, it started with this and in the city of São Paulo. But then it grew very large. Uh, over the, the whole corruption sphere, and it also met the what was then the start of the, of certain investigations within the the Dilma Rousseff administration over corruption scandals dealing with our Brazilian, um, you know, our our petroleum uh, oil, our, our oil uh, production. It, it was very connected to Petrobras, you know, it was our, our oil and gas um, company. It, uh, Petrobras is, is owned by the state, uh, is only 50% by the state, the other 50 is uh, is traded in the Bovespa, which is our, um, I forgot the name, is like NASDAQ and, and like New York State Exchange. So, um, so what... What we get from this, the the whole process was very um, mediated. We, you know, it was very explicit to everyone. It was shown every day in the television. Everyone discussed it. This was the, the still the, the very early days of mass engagement in social uh, networks. So everyone in 2013 had a Facebook account. Everyone had a Twitter account. Uh, it was the heyday of Instagram. You know, it was. This, this kind of era, 
and we were all discussing politics explicitly. But also, we we ha still had this understanding that politics had to be uh, in a certain way. We were still very uh, young, actually. Everyone was, was still very young. Everyone uh, wanted a better country. And so we did not understand what was going on in the backstage of it, of this, because the whole the whole thing about petro about not only the oil industry is that, but also with other industries such as public construction and all of that, is that they interconnect with the whole structure of the the their economy. When you stop oil production or when you dificultate it, you also um, you also stop the the production of boats. You also stop the production of certain uh, specific mat specific chemistry materials, and you and this also ramifies the whole economy because all these jobs are being uh, not being well paid, or they are or, or these factories start closing. This demand start being supplied the, and in the other sphere, the the, the public demand starts to to stop because all these contracts are now being analyzed constantly in order to seek for. Uh, corrup corruption scandals. So this affects deeply our domestic economy and the ability of the government to respond to the crisis because the, the, the it cannot use its usual um, it, its usual mechanisms for do, uh, for demand for stimulus, right? So uh, what was then the problem? Problem that was that this grows so much. And this investigation went so deeply that it got to very big affairs. It got to the, the high uh, the high offices of the government, but also to the high um, high places in the, the, the private sector. So it got to presidents of companies of mo very big multinationals, actually. And and yet this what we know right now was also politically motivated by the, the judge, which was uh, Sergio Moro. And also was the, from the uh, what we then discovered some years later was a politically motivated prosecutor and in, in his in his team in a very uh, intertwined connection to a certain training and certain dialogues with investigations going on in other countries. When you follow this lead, you you eventually find out that this this prom these prosecutors and these judges were also. Uh, trained um, well, they, they had their own connections and they, they shared a lot of information privately to uh, American investigators. So this starts to get very, I don't know. You see where I'm getting, right? So uh, when you follow this this logic and we, when when you follow this trace, you also see that the the same protests that went on in 2013 also went very far against the government and towards the far right. They started to uh, to organize themselves in what was then just uh, rights organizations, but they their arguments and their philosophical backing ground, background also started to flirt explicitly with fascism. And this is where the, the, the core basis for Bolsonaro's rise to power comes from. But this is also the, the link between the, the erosion of the Workers' Party administration and their, loose, uh, their eventual lose to power with the with Dilma's Rousseff impeachment in 2015. And also uh, it gets very, very bad still because when her vice president rises to power, which was not from her party, he starts to enact a very different economic platform for the, for the country. Brazil takes a turn towards uh, explicit neoliberalism, and these policies actually they uh, they stop to enable the, our economy recovery. When Bolsonaro is elected in 2018, after the the interruption of Dilma Rousseff's mandate, and after obviously the her vice president rise to power, his name was Mich uh, Michel Temer. Um, Bolsonaro is elected, and then the the same judge that judged. Uh, the Lula's case and Dilma Rousseff's case back in the the first I don't know uh, first level of the, the, the judiciary he then became the the Ministry for Justice so these people talked previously and it, these investigations went on uh, during the Bolsonaro administration and it was very 
publicly uh, expl it got to the point to especially in 2019 to be very explicit that the, there was a, a very big connection to this so you, you see there is a process of derailing of the brazilian economy that that goes in parallel to the derailing in politics and all of this uh, incapacitates by the brazilian ability to establish uh, a, a linear arrangement and a linear dialogue to their partners so who you will negotiate uh, lockman if you do not know who will be the the brazilian government next year you, you just do not know and we are in a political crisis for over i don't know eight maybe seven to eight years we're going on with this um so it's it gets to the point of being unpredictable so how how could a core um core partner just like china react china does not uh has a, a policy of not interacting in the the domestic affairs even though i i i think that this interaction is interve this intervention is very misunderstood i do know that china do, will will not interfere with uh, big voting uh, and, and things like that the way the United States does it's just not their thing China will not risk it and yet uh, so how could they react they reacted the way they could they just tried to keep things on track so China keeps commerce China keeps having a, a formal dialogue tries to have a formal dialogue with the administration uh, we wherever uh, wherever the, the, the administration is even though Bolsonaro uh, wants it, it to go the other way, right? China, Bolsonaro wants to use China as a big scapegoat for the worsening of our relations and uh, of the worsening of the domestic economy as well the, in this year. So you, you see how it goes. If China confronts Bolsonaro, China will become the big devil, right? It will become the, the nemesis of the nation. So China tries to not engage in, 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 in this in this kind of dialogue china uh, actually has been quite smart that uh, maybe they are waiting for bolsonaro to go away i don't know but uh it it will be decided actually next year when we have elections over here so i i guess i answered your question yes uh, that is really great uh, answers so i would you like to ask now uh, how did the economic chaos you have mentioned affect uh, the brazilian economy and how does this point uh, correlate with the mid 2000s 2010s fall of the commodity price and did this change affect the economic relations between the brazil and the china uh so uh, if you only produce uh soy if you only produce iron ore if you only produce coal if your whole uh foreign commerce is related to this then you will have problems when whoever um, wherever another country starts to produce it as well so if Nigeria grows their soybean of um, soybean markets if Angola starts growing um, soybeans or it starts to export oil to China then the price will be affected as well by the time by the mid uh, not not the mid but by 2013 actually which is actually our we're getting back to it a lot today so uh during this period uh, the united states was not reacting to the the economy still it, it, it started to, re to grow back again of course but it was not quick the obama administration was having a lot of problems uh, managing the the return of the workforce to the workplaces and it actually never returned to the to the to the levels it had in the 2000s the the government actually changed the whole pattern of uh of analyzing the economic activity and, and so to to have if you have i don't know 10 hours of work in the united states per week then you will be employed even though you're working almost nothing right and you're being paid almost nothing so the american economy is not restarting uh, the, the China's uh, China's economy, even though the Chinese government launched a very big, very big yet yes, um, package of economic recovery in 2009. Uh, by 2011, they were not growing the same pace. It was the last year they they grew over 10 percent. They started to grow very less, 
So if you go very last, if you grow less, then um, obviously you, are, you will not import as much. So um, if you not import as much, obviously the the whole cost of uh, the international markets of commodities will fall, and this it starts to affect everyone. It affects not not only us but also um, even the American economy gets affected by this locally. What you have is this. The Brazilian economy was deeply affected, but also the, the Equatorian economy was deeply affected. The Venezuelan economy was deeply affected. Everyone uh, had their own domestic problems. And yet, we were in a very good position still, the, the Brazilian economy. Because, see, uh, we are a very big economy. At this point, we were maybe the seventh, seventh uh, largest, largest economy in the whole world. And we had acquired a lot of dollars in the international market. So we could respond through, through monetary measures. We could respond to this crisis. And yet, uh, we did not respond in the appropriate manners. We still had these problems. How would we uh, realign our domestic economy uh, in order to respond to this? Because you see, whenever you take a, a political and economic decision in this sphere, you will also face very big interests. The domestic bourgeoisie will try to fight you because they will—they are losing money. They were already losing money. So, what will you do? Can you really crack down on them? Um, well, you can try, but you know you have to divide them very, very badly because otherwise they will realign themselves and their interests will re rearrange in order to face you back. And the Dilma administration tried to do this using the, I don't know, the interest rates of, of, the, of the Brazilian economy. Bra Brazil spent um, over almost 20 years having very high interest rates in order to use the, the, the interest rates as a manner to destimulate economic growth. And by de-stimulating the economic growth, it stopped inflation. So we are getting back to the A is the fair, right? But when you understand this, you, you also understand that Brazil, by using this interest rates, Brazil also became almost like a, a country that attracts a lot of international capital to be reinvested here. Because you will receive the dividends of the from the bank system, right? Through the, the interest rates. It will attract a lot of capital. And Brazil started operating like, I don't know, like a, a, par, a, a fiscal paradise, you know, a bit, a bit like that. There is a, a, an economic discussion that goes very deeply into this. But when you have this uh, the system in place, the bourgeoisie was all, our domestic bourgeoisie was, was also using it. So they were receiving a lot of dividends through the interest rates because they reinvested their their profits through the bank system. So if they're receiving all this money, if you actually try to slash the interest rates, they will receive very less. The, they had so, so much changed their way of receiving profits from the, the real economy to financialization that they needed this money. And so when Dilma tried to face them, oh, this is where her problems actually started. Because there was a, a very much a domestic turn in, and uh, an explicit realignment of their whole interests as separated political segments into a cohesive class to face her. Uh, obviously, Dilma lacked, lacked a, a lot of personal ability to deal with this. Uh, her government started to decompose itself uh, to everyone that could, that could see. And this was all uh, our domestic uh, effects dealing with the international crisis. So you see, it, it's also, uh, it is very much um, connected to the whole world market affairs. Uh, this process also is replicated in a lot of countries in the, in the in South America. The, the crisis in Argentina was was also, very, uh, was also very bad, you know, in Argentina was also very bad, in Uruguay was also very bad. Uh, in Ecuador, it was devastating. Ecuador had, uh, I don't know, in 2015, Ecuador uh, shrunk almost um, almost 10% in one year of, the, of their GDP. Venezuela 
got got very much derailed only by the not only by United States sanctions, but also because of the international prices of oil. So you see, this also affects us regionally, and this also creates the same same uh, socioeconomic environment for the rise of the far right throughout the whole continent. So Bolsonaro is not only a problem for, for Brazil, but also the other countries have their own uh, aspirants to Bolsonaro. You know that there are also problems um, in Peru right now, uh, since Keiko Fujimori does not recognize the Pedro Castillo government. That there is also there are also obviously problems uh, in Paraguay as well. In, in Argentina, there are candidates to that, but Argentina has their own contexts in place. So you see, this affects all of us in different ways. Of course, every country is every every country is different, but also there are things that um, align us in the same uh, historical frame. In the end of uh, our program, I am going to ask the last and the most updated question about the pandemic. How is the pandemic going in Brazil? This is the first, and as we understand, there are several political and geopolitical issues going on within the president uh, J. Bolsonaro's administration regarding China. There is a possibility of an uh, explicit partnership between Brazil and the USA, and did uh, Bolsonaro's uh, election change the Brazil Brazilian relation with the China? Well, these are very this is a very good one because you know uh, well, let, let's see uh, as the world already knows the Bolsonaro administration uh, was terrible re act, uh, reaction to the to the pandemic you know we were only the actually the silver medal to the United States first place in worst case scenario of the pandemic we lost over. Uh, we are almost reaching the point of losing 600,000 people because of this. I'm actually very lucky. I, I did not I did not lose anyone to the pandemic, but I also live in a part of the, the of the country that is not that much inhabited. My, uh, even though Brazil is almost to the point of two, uh, 220 million people, I live in a, a state that only has almost five million. So it's very small state and a very uh, it's not very dense. Our population is not very dense. So uh, I maybe maybe we're losing about five to ten people per day in my state. But there were specific crises in other parts of Brazil that was that were devastating. There were almost um, there were there were states that had, that lost almost seven hundred people per day. You know, in at certain points of this year alone. Uh, Brazil was also very much isolated from the from international affairs because of this. Not only because Bolsonaro responded badly, because but also because the pandemic was so bad here that we also had our own variants uh, developing in the domestic in the domestic affairs. Obviously, nobody chooses to have a variant, but also if you let people interact that much, if you let the the the, the disease spread to this level. Then obviously there will be more chances of the the virus to mutate itself. So this creates a very big problem, and yet the government did not did nothing. And we are a country that we have our own uh, healthcare system, which is publicly owned. We are we have our own NHS, you know, like like in Britain, we have our own. It's all it's also based in the NHS and also in the Cuban and the Canadian experiences dealing with public welfare. So and it's free. It's actually public owned and, and accessible to the to everyone. It's universal. It's not only it's it is not restricted to Brazilian citizens. So we have this structure in place. We also have the the historical historical footprint, the historical experience to uh, you know to invest in nation. Uh, as far as Bolsonaro's concern goes and his attempt to discredit the, the vaccines, uh, following up on uh, the, uh, the far right in the United States, obviously, even though he tries to discredit the vaccines, the Brazilian population is, is getting to the point where 95% of the Brazilians say they will get vaccinated, even though Bolsonaro's approval is close to 30%. So there are a lot of Bolsonaro's electors that will get vaccinated. There are, I know, I know them. You know that these people exist. 
they okay they like bolsonaro but they also know that vaccines are from like from their own experience they know that vaccines are good they know that vaccines work we got to the point actually uh maybe two days ago where more uh, a larger part of the, the brazilian population got uh, the brazilian population no but the brazilian um adult um you know the workforce in brazil actually got to the point where we have a larger percent of vaccine or vaccinated people it's close to 71 percent it's we just surpassed the united states in vaccinating the, the adult population through in the first dose of course so uh it's speeding up we have the structure we have the the knowledge we have the even the cultural affairs is covered up and yet we re reacted so badly to this crisis how come so the investigations that are going on in the congress are discovering that the bolsonaro administration is deeply connected to the the explicit and the planned spread of the of the disease we're getting to the point that maybe we will discuss uh soon enough uh you no know, you're talking about crisis uh crimes against humanity over here that this is the very serious because the government actually had plans to let it, it the, the the disease spread in hoping that we will develop uh, a certain collective um uh, collective immunity towards the, the, the disease you know even though we had a lot of specialists knowing the uh, informing the government that this would not happen that this this just is not the case but they were planning on it and they also there is also a very interesting thing going on about the the buyout of international vaccines because the government could have developed our own domestic vaccine we have in universities to do this we have the, the domestic the healthcare experience um so we could have done it we could but what we're discussing now is that the it seems that the bolsonaro administration did not want to buy a vaccine from pfizer it it preferred for some other reason to buy certain vaccines over the others and we are uh, starting to discover that what's, why why how is it and how could that this come but the footprint that this leaves behind is, is very bad in the international arena right because the reaction was so bad that uh brazil from all of the release brazil turned into an international pariah not only for the the environmental issues that apply in brazil the destruction of the amazon uh, and, the, and the whole uh well it's, it's actually very bad because it only not only affects them amazon but it, it affects the whole fun functioning of the, the environment in the whole world and and yet bolsonaro favors the destruction of amazon in, in in a very colonial actually understanding of what it is to have a nation you know and and yet so this is the guy and this is these are his policies and yet he expresses himself as some sort of cold warrior you know there are obviously parallels to what australia is doing but but australia got a lot of backlash from china everybody knows that australia um their exports to china were or stop uh, you know and even though this is happening actually still keeps up the discourse against china and the effect on their exports and meat and other food processing were also in the the mining uh, industry in australia and yet brazil is not having uh this sort of reactions even though there are twitter uh you know at twitter the, the brazilian uh, representatives also exchange um bad words with the with the chinese diplomats in brazil it's that is it's very uh it's very funny to, to watch this because uh well as everyone knows china is having a a new new sort of diplomacy you know the whole wolf warrior talk and all of that but uh even though this is happening and even though china is uh discussing with the, these people and like tra trading um you know uh bad words uh online with their between their representatives and some congressmen or of some sort they also keep their 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 relations to brazil this will not be a, 
be affected by, by this crisis. So there are more than one movement going on here. Even Brazil did not have any sanctions uh, to China. But Brazil is from China to Brazil. But Brazil yet is starting to upgrade its confrontation to China. Maybe thinking that uh, if we do that, maybe China will react. But if China reacts, who will uh, have the gains? I ask you, Lockman. Who will have the, the political gains if, if China reacts to Brazil? Of course, will be the Bolsonaro administration. They will finally get their foreign enemy they so desperately, desperately want. Bolsonaro, uh, back in 2019, when the environmental issue was previous to the, to the pandemic, when, uh, when the environmental question was being discussed, Bolsonaro tried to put France as our core enemy. You know, France, all the way across the ocean. Of course, we share with them a, a, a border in, in French Guiana, but, you know, uh, as you try to use them as an uh, as international um, enemy. The Bolsonaro administration is also trying to do that to China and a bit against the, the Biden administration as well. Bolsonaro is trying to face them. And and yet the, the Americans are now saying that they will invite us, the, invite the Brazilians to the to maybe being a partner at NATO. So this is to show that something deeper is going on here. And maybe, maybe the Bolsonaro administration is not, not that bad. They have their own strategy dealing with the world, uh, even though I do not like them, and I, it's very explicit, but I also understand that they do have a geopolitical thing going on here, and they are realizing Brazil politically maybe closer to the United States, and maybe this is the, the United States strategy as well. Uh, so that's why Bolsonaro seems to be trying to discover if the Biden administration, if they insult them, they will still work with us because we are too important in South America and too important in the world sphere still, at least in the, the economic sphere, uh, to being players in the, the, in the whole uh, realignment of the world affairs in this decade. China seems to know it. That's why they are not confronting us, even though, Bolsonaro, or even though a core ally of Bolsonaro just said that uh, that our Supreme Court was actually controlled by China. Imagine that. So uh, this kind of religion, of domestic politics also is intertwining with the international sphere, and uh, it will it will all have a, a showdown next year when we have domestic elections as well. So everything can change or everything can stay the way it is. We uh, we have some more time to get to know it, right? So that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for providing us really with a great discussion about the historical and uh, diplomatic bilateral relation of China and Brazil. It is really important in the contemporary world. Uh, and you are also living as a Brazilian. You you provide us a preliminary source. I thank you very much for joining me also today. I hope we can meet in another program. Well, thank you very much, Lockman. I, I, I'm glad to be here. Uh, also, uh, I'd, I'd like to also thank my, my, my good friend, Pedro Fonseca, who, which also recommended me to, to meet you here. So, but it was, very, uh, it was great talking to you. It was great knowing you as well. So, uh, whenever you want, call me, all right? And let's stay in touch. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, okay see you in the next program.